In section 3.4, we're going to look at linear regression, which is really a statistical method. Even though we saw it in the growth models chapter and we did some calculations with it, here we're going to dig in a little bit deeper and see a little bit more of the kind of details of how linear regression is developed. So the core concept is just like what we saw in chapter two where we were trying to model some relationship between two things. And I have the example here of house sizes and prices. And you can see a connection between the two sort of without any data, you can make, a sen make sense of the fact that the price of a house depends partly at least on the size of the house. So larger houses are generally more expensive. So it's a good idea when you start looking at data like this to draw a scatter plot to see the connection between two things. And we do in fact see a trend that as you increase the size of the house, the values for the prices start to go up. So there's this upward trend. There's a little bit of terminology you'll see here and you can read through again in, in detail, but there's this term association, which has to do with this connection between two things. Two variables are associated if we see that kind of clustering. There can be a clustering around a straight line, and that's what we're gonna look at alone in this section. We won't do any other kinds of, of regression other than just linear. But it's possible you can have quadratic or exponential like we did in chapter two, or even other kinds of trends. But we're just gonna look at linear trends here in this section. We can talk about positive and negative associations, Positive is like this one with the house sizes, where as the size increases, so does the price. If larger sizes led to lower prices, it would be a negative association. It would look like the reverse of this. So here's a few examples of some plots of different kinds of associations, positive and negative linear ones, and then positive and negative nonlinear ones. So these would be more like quadratic or exponential. And then here's one where there's just sort of random noise. There's not a clear association between the two. This little side note over in the margin is a good one to read and pay attention to. It gives you a good way to kind of think about how strong an association is. So the first question we're gonna ask in this chapter is how strong that linear association is. And the term we use for this is correlation. So correlation. And correlation is a measure of how strong a linear relationship is. So we're going to get a number called the correlation coefficient. And based on that number, we're going to judge whether the linear relationship is a good one or whether it's not a really good fit to describe that data with a line. So that's a concrete way of answering that question. Rather than just looking at a graph and convincing ourselves whether or not there's a linear connection we can have a specific measure of that. And then once we've decided that there is a strong linear relationship, then we can find the equation that matches that. And again, this is the part that'll be familiar from chapter two when we did linear models and especially linear regression. So that will be pretty familiar and, and won't take a lot of uh, time to figure out. So correlation, again, there's gonna be this measure, this correlation coefficient that we call R and that will describe for us how strong the linear relationship is. So there's a few examples here, the same examples I had earlier, with their R values that are matching. And from those examples, there are some properties you can read about here. Basically, the closer R is to one or negative one, the stronger the linear relationship is. If it's positive, it's an upward positive linear relationship. If it's negative, it goes down. R can't ever go past one or negative one, but if it's really, really close to positive one, it's a really strong, tightly clustered linear trend. If it's really close to negative one, it's really, really close to a, a straight line in the negative direction. And then if it's closer to zero, there's less of a linear trend. So these are still not bad, but not quite as linear. Here, this random one has an R value very close to zero. So that's basically, there's no linear correlation between the two. There's a little scale here that has a uh, sort of standard, generally accepted values. If you have an R value past 0.8 on either side, that's usually what we call a strong one. 
between 0.6 and 0.8 or negative 0.6 and negative 0.8. We call it moderate and then so on. So you can read through and make sense of that. Again, there's nothing magical about these numbers. These are just sort of ones that by convention, a lot of people have accepted and um, are generally, generally common terminology that we use there. So there's an example of interpreting an R value just based on that table. To calculate R, there's a complicated formula that we're not going to ever use. We'll just let the calculator do it for us. But you could do it theoretically if you had the time and energy to go through and calculate that. But it's not interesting enough to spend time on and not something we need to do once we have the, the calculator handy. There's a little note here, and this is an important thing just to know outside of this class in general. Just because there's a correlation between two things, because two things happen together, that doesn't necessarily mean that one of them caused the other. In some cases, it's true. In other cases, it's just that two things happen to occur at the same time. For instance, the number of injuries in a swimming pool and the sales of ice cream cones are connected or correlated, but neither one of them causes the other. It's just that both are more common in warmer weather. So there's a third piece to the puzzle that causes both of them uh, that we, if we aren't paying attention, we might think that there's a, a connection that there isn't, that there's a link between one of them causing the other, but it wouldn't be the case. So there's a term, a confounder or a confounding variable you may run across in some places. That's what that um, term refers to, that there's a third hidden piece that affects both of them. And then sometimes they're just coincidence. And there's a, a whole website with a bunch of examples of things that coincidentally are correlated together, but there's no connection between them. It just so happens that if you look at enough data, you'll eventually run across some things that happen to trend in the same direction. Uh, no, no real relationship between them um, at all. So once we've decided that there is a correlation, once we've calculated an R value, as we'll see with the calculator a little later on, then we can get into the regression part, which says, okay, now let's find the actual equation that connects these two variables. And this is the part that is relatively familiar where you've used the calculator for this before, but you can read through some of this description. Basically, this gives you the theory behind it. There are a couple of formulas that we won't really use, but this is where they come from. This is what the calculator actually does when it calculates these. It goes through and calculates the average for both x and y and the standard deviation for both of them and then puts them all in these formulas like this example here which again you won't really need to do this in practice but it kind of shows you how you could go through and use those formulas to do it more commonly we just let the calculator handle all of it and as we've used several times now in the stat menu if you go to the calc listing there's the um, option for linear regression, just like we did in, in chapter two when we uh, did linear regression there. And if you go through and calculate everything like we've done, you see the values for A and B, and you should also see this value for R. It's possible that you won't initially. There are instructions for what to do in your calculator if you don't initially see it. Basically, there's a setting you have to turn on and once you do, when you go through and do this, it'll show you the value for R. So when you practice this on your calculator, you should see whether it shows you R or not. And if it doesn't, follow the instructions here to um, get that to show up. So there's an example or two with some data where you're going to calculate the regression line and then make predictions with it. You can follow those examples. There's not anything um, really new there once you've gone through previous examples, uh, these should be fairly straightforward. So you can go through and make predictions with a regression line. Then this last example is one that um, kind of packages it all together and asks you to do a bunch of different things with the same data set. So you can go through, again, that example, go through it very carefully and make sure that, that things make sense on that one. Then at the end, there's a quick section on how to use Excel to do the same thing. Um, again, we saw this in chapter two as well, but you can go in and add a scatter plot. And once you do, there's an option to add a regression line and show the, the results there. So you can go through and follow that if you would like to use Excel for your homework or for the project um, or test, feel free to do so 
um, following these examples.